The story of Dr. Kildare. Whatsoever house I enter, there will I go for the benefit of the sick. Whatsoever things I see or hear concerning the life of men, I will keep silence thereon, counting such things to be held as sacred trust. I will give no deadly drug to any, though it be asked. The story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers and Lionel Barrymore. Metro Goldwyn Mayer brought you those famous motion pictures. And now, for the first time, this exciting, heartwarming series is heard on radio. In just a moment, the story of Dr. Kildare. But first, your announcer. Now, the story of Dr. Kildare, starring Lou Ayers as Dr. Kildare and Lionel Barrymore as Dr. Gillespie. Blair General Hospital, one of the great citadels of American medicine. A clump of gray-white buildings planted deep in the heart of New York, a nerve center of medical progress where great minds and skilled hands wage man's everlasting battle against death and disease. Blair General Hospital, where life begins, where life ends, where life goes on. Good morning, Dr. Kildare. Oh, my, you look tired. Morning, Parker. I am tired. Dr. Gillespie, and yet? He's down in the clinic. Oh, that man. Bad mood. Bad? Oh, horrible. Fine. Uh, let's see now. Dr. Kildare speaks. Hello. Is this Dr. James Kildare? Yes. Who's this, please? Jimmy. Jimmy, this is Angela. Angela Kester. Angela Kester. Well, I didn't know you were in New York. When'd you get in? Last night, flew in from Chicago. Jimmy, I, I must see you right away. It's important. Well, I won't be off duty until tonight. Jimmy, it's an emergency. I've got to see you now. Hey, you do sound worried. What's the trouble? It's deep. My husband. I think something terrible's going to happen. It's mine. He's sick. Well, who's your doctor, Angela? I haven't any doctor. Not anymore. Oh, please. But, Angela, my work here at the hospital, I, I can't Please, possibly... Please, Jimmy. 612 East 73rd. Believe me, I'm afraid. I'm terribly afraid. I don't understand, Angela. You're afraid of what? He wants to kill me. I know it. Stephen wants to kill me. Oh, wait a minute, You've Angela. You've got to believe me. Oh, please, hurry. 612 East 73rd. Is that right? Yes, Jimmy. All right, Angela. I'll be right out. Still there? What's the big hurry? You're not an intern anymore. Rush call, Dr. Gillespie. Rush call? Where? East 73rd, old friends of mine. Lots of trouble. Well, which is it? Not enough love or not enough money? It might be either. She's afraid her husband's going to kill her. <laughs> well, that's enough to keep a woman's mind off her housework. Dr. Kildare. Well, nosy Parker. Why do you keep on busting in here all the time? Oh, Dr. Kildare. Parker, if anyone wants me, I'll be at the home of Mrs. Angela Kester. Oh, all right, Doctor, but just a moment. Parker, I'm in a hurry. Uh, but there's a man. He just came into the reception room. He wants to see you. I'm sorry, Parker, he but He says I... his name is Kester, Stephen Kester. That's the way it's been going with her, Doctor. Every week, she gets a little worse. I see. Five years ago, Angela Kester is one of the finest concert pianists in this country. Today, she's nothing. When did all this begin, Steve? I mean, when did she start blowing up in the middle of concerts? Close to five years ago. A few months after we were married. Did Angela show any abnormal behavior just before that first breakdown? Oh, she was working awfully hard, practicing 16 hours a day sometimes. Mm. It was kind of strange. Like something was pushing it. As though her success was a matter of life and death. It was almost as if she was possessed. And it's still the same. The harder she works at her music, the more the obsession grows. Mm -hmm. oh, you said before there was a particular composition that she keeps on playing. Yes. A revolutionary etude by Chopin. Every time she sits down to play. Sometimes she can go on for, oh, half an hour without breaking. Beethoven, Liszt, Brahms. And she goes back to it. Does that piece have any particular significance to Angela? None that I know of. 
It was one of her father's favorites. He's dead now. He had great ideas about Angela's career. I see. Uh, now about this latest fixation of hers, this, uh, this fear that you are going to murder her. First time I've heard that one. It's the first thing she told me on the phone. She's really getting bad. I guess. Yes. I think I'd better drop out to your place and see Angela for a few minutes. Come on, we'd better hurry. Yeah, we can we can watch her here from behind these glass doors. Is the nurse with her constantly? Yes. I don't dare leave her alone. Mm. She still plays beautifully. Yes, I know. But wait. Wait, you'll see. Steve, uh, the doctors that have been handling Angela's case, what kind of treatments have they been giving her? Oh, I think she's been through about all of them. Two courses of insulin shock, two courses of electric shock. I, I don't know what else. When did she have her last shock treatment? Oh, about six months ago. They helped for a while, then, then she slips back into the same old, same old condition. Listen. You hear? She's breaking up now. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. It's almost as if something had taken hold of her, pushing her, twisting her body, some strange force. I cannot! I cannot! Steve, stay here. I'm going in. Go on. Set them free, Angela. Now, don't be afraid. I'm going to help you. Still there? Is that you? Yes, Dr. Gillespie. Ah, sit down, Jimmy. Sit down. Here, sit down. Thanks, I could use one. Yeah. I think it's high time somebody told you this. What? You've been going too hard. Ever since you got back to the hospital from the army. Oh, now, let's not go over all that again. Yeah, no, nah, if we will, we will too. Just because they appointed you a resident physician, that doesn't mean that you have to do all the work. But you know how shorthanded we've been, how many patients we have. Yeah. Yeah, and you go on out and take on more. Look, Jimmy, you've just got so much energy to spend in one day, and that's all. Now you're going to tell me I need a vacation. That's exactly what you do need. <laughs> Listen, Jimmy, you've been a doctor long enough to know you can't save all the lives in the world. Sorry, Dr. Gillespie, I can't take the time off. Besides, I've got the research work on leukemia to do, and that paper for the medical institute. And besides that, you'd hate to be away from that beautiful nurse, Mary Lamont. Huh? Go on, admit it. Oh, your spies are working overtime. <laughs> They're always working overtime. Uh-huh. You haven't dated Mary Lamont for three weeks. Now, that's a late bullet. Why haven't you? Oh, the Angela Kester thing, I guess. It takes a lot of time. Well, why did you take the case in the first place? You don't have enough to do here, right? You have to go out looking for work. Doctor, 
Until her mind got sick, Angela Keston was on her way to becoming one of the greatest concert pianists in the world. I'm convinced she can still be one of the greatest pianists in the world. Yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, how do you go about curing her? I'm not sure yet. What's your diagnosis? She's suffering from a neurosis, obsessive, compulsive, superimposed, paranoid tendencies. Well, I have to give you credit, Sylvia. When you pick a bad one, you pick the worst. What are the symptoms? Deep-seated compulsive complex is the first thing I noticed. See, Angela had one of those fathers who wants great things for his children, whether they want it or not. He was a second-rate pianist himself, but he was determined Angela would reach the top. I guess he impressed her with that as soon as she was old enough to understand. Eh, stupid parents. Her father was a widower. Didn't have much money, but he spent every spare dollar he could get on piano lessons for Angela. Evidently, he made her realize how much he was sacrificing to make her a great artist. Eh, he grew out of all proportion in her mind. Right. And by the time she was ten years old, she was afraid to be a failure. She had to make it. There was no other way out for her. When did it first show on the surface? Oh, five years ago. Angela was about 22 at the time. The night before she was to sail for Europe for a concert tour, she had a recital at Carnegie Hall. She went to pieces. Oh, too bad, too bad. You spotted the neuroses, all right. Obsessive, compulsive. What about the paranoid tendency? Now, they've just started showing up lately. She's developing all kinds of persecution complexes. And thinks the public's against her, thinks her husband's going to kill her. Too bad. Ah, dratted bone. Hello, Dr. Gillespie talking. Huh? Who? Just a minute. Still there. You. Hello? Yes. When? I'll be right over. It was Stephen Kester, Angela's husband. Well, Angela just shot herself. The story of Dr. Kildare will continue in just a moment. Call me back later. I want my medical journal. Where have you hidden it? It's right back in the middle of your desk. Then why didn't you say so? Always hiding things. Oh, sorry about that. By the way, what about those reprints I asked for? The ones on prefrontal lobotomy? They're sending them up from the research library. Well, tell them to hurry. The patient's dying. Doctor, you don't have a patient. Keep your nose out of my business. I'll go on. Stop. Dr. Glisty's office. Parker, this is Dr. Kildare. Just finished the surgery. Yes, Doctor. Here's the report on Angela Kester that Dr. Gillespie asked for. All right, Doctor. I'll take it. Self-inflicted bullet wound on left side of chest. Bullet penetrated the chest cage. Small pneumothorax. No serious injuries. 
bullet lodged just beneath the skin under the left shoulder blade, easily removed. Patient 